Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this, our first Let's Meet of the Year. And indeed, we will be examining uh, where the gas sector should be going in light of the recent events uh, that have occurred in Europe. Of course, the context of this Let's Meet is taking place with the background of the war in Ukraine. And I must start uh, by extending the support and solidarity of Eurogas to the people of Ukraine, and in particular, to our colleagues in Naftogas of Ukraine, who are working extremely hard every day to keep the distribution system operating in the Ukraine uh, so that gas continues to flow to keep people warm and provide hot water. They're doing a tremendous job in incredibly difficult circumstances, and our full support goes to them this morning. Of course, the context of the climate emergency also still exists, and we are indeed looking at what we can do as a sector to quickly decarbonize and indeed to also diversify our suppliers of gas. Today, I'm very lucky to be joined by experts who will look at the different aspects of the European Commission's recent communications and regulation proposal for gas storage. Uh, I'll be joined by Tatiana Marquez Uriata, a member of Commissioner Simpson's cabinet, who is very much heavily involved in these issues around the gas sector. I'll also be joined by Marcus Nubra, who is director from ITM Power, uh, one of the world's largest electrolyzer manufacturers. I'll also be uh, joined by Julia uh, Laura Cancian, uh, who is now the Secretary General of the European Biogas Association. We're very happy to have her with us this morning. And then finally, Roxana Kalaminti, the Deputy Secretary General of Gas Infrastructure Europe, will be with us, who will also look at elements around LNG and gas storage. This, of course, remains an interactive event. Uh, we are very, very keen to have your questions, uh, the questions of the audience, uh, to be able to put these to our panelists, uh, because it is, in the end, a good opportunity for you to also raise your voices and your questions and concerns about the packages that you've seen, and also, of course, in relation to the gas uh, storage regulation. Um, I think that, uh, indeed, there will be plenty of time uh, for questions, so please do use the Q&A function that you find at the bottom of the screen on Zoom, as so you can just click on it, and you can write your question. Please do remember to use your name and also the organization uh, so that we are able to uh, re reflect on, the, on whose behalf the question is asked. And ultimately, uh, the strength of this will be indeed your involvement and not just my moderation of it and the expert comments. I think uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Tatiana Marquez Uriata. And maybe Tatiana, if you'd like to join me and put on your camera and uh, come off mute, uh, we'd be very happy to hear uh, your opening statement uh, of 10 minutes, outlining the Commission's thinking in this context, as I've described, climate emergency on one hand, war in Ukraine, need for di diversification on the other. You've been very, very active. This means we've all been very active as well. Uh, and we have to say, you know, you know, we have to commend the speed with which you've acted and the, the speed in which you've been able to bring out uh, very, very new, strong ideas and so, yes, I think we'd all like to hear a bit more about that. Tatiana, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, James. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much also to Eurogas for the invitation to be with you today. So I understand that the title of the event is Repower EU, where should the gas sector be going? And I would like to start by saying that um, for the European Commission, the direction for the gas sector is clear and was already set in December with our package last year. This is the decarbonization of the gas sector within the framework of the Green Deal. The war in Ukraine and the current uncertainties and uh, price volatility we have experienced in the sector are only, according to us, an accelerator of this process. They rather confirm that the faster that we sift from natural gas towards biogas and clean hydrogen, the better. And this is not only for sustainability reasons, but also for security of supply and affordability reasons. So let me try to um, spend the next, the next minutes uh, to develop this idea a little bit further. First, I would like to recall uh, some of the main elements of the hydrogen and decarbonized gas market package that was adopted by the Commission last December. I know you all, or most of you know all the elements, but I would like to briefly recall them. Secondly, I would like to explain how the latest geopolitical um, developments are speeding up the process of 
uh, decarbonization. And secondly, I'm sorry, and thirdly, I would like to highlight some areas where the Commission is focusing its action in the coming weeks to cope with the ongoing developments that James was just referring and to ensure that the gas security of supply uh, is possible for European citizens and businesses. Now, regarding the December package, um, the Commission published a package of legislative proposals on hydrogen and gas decarbonized mar markets last December. The main goal of this package is to bring the Green Deal objectives to the gas sector. We have in the EU the objective of becoming carbon neutral by 2050 and reducing our greenhouse gases emissions by 50, 55% by 2030. A decarbonized European energy system cannot rely on electricity only. We will also need a decarbonized gas sector, in particular to provide secure and competitive energy to hard to abate sectors like maritime and aviation or some industrial manufacturing. The 4th of December package, looking to how to encourage the development of these new gases and how to ensure that they could access the existing natural gas networks that we have today, mainly um, designed for natural gas. So the package covers four main goals. The first one is to develop a robust hydrogen market. We want that we have in Europe a competitive, open, dynamic hydrogen market by 2030, a market where hydrogen is produced where it's most affordable, traded in liquid markets, and easily accessible for consumers. We want that the new hydrogen market is based on proven principles of energy network regulation that already apply to the gas or electricity markets such as not discriminatory third party access, regulation of access tariffs and the separation of hydrogen production and transport activities. And at the same time, we are conscious that the hydrogen sectors is still emerging and needs to be a scale up. So we consider therefore necessary that in a first phase um, until 2030, our hydrogen companies should enjoy a certain flexibility in the application of these rules. By setting the rules, applying both before and after 2030, the Commission is also providing certainty for investors who want to invest in the hydrogen market. Secondly, so the second goal of the package is that uh, we wanted to make it easier for renewable and low carbon gases to access the existing natural gas system. This means access to both the markets and the infrastructure. To improve the competitiveness of these new gases, the proposals remove cross-border tariffs for them, for these new gases, including um, at LNG terminals and significantly reduce injection tariffs and capacity-based tariffs at entry and exit points to storage facilities. The proposals also establish a certification system for low carbon hydrogen in line with the certification rules for renewable hydrogen that we already proposed last July as part of the proposal to revise the renewables directive. Third goal, of the proposal is to integrate better electricity, gas, hydrogen networks, to do a more efficient use of them. This is why we propose that the infrastructure planning is done on the basis of joint scenarios for electricity, gas, and hydrogen. We also presented a proposal to create a dedicated hydrogen transmission operators body at EU level to promote the development of hydrogen infrastructure and to work with the other network bodies, the NSOG and the NSOE. And fourth and final point on the package, we want to ensure that the transition to cleaner energy is fair and just. There's no reason why gas consumers should not have the same rights as electricity consumers. So we propose to align as much as possible the consumer rights aspects of the gas directive with those already applicable under the electricity directive. So has the war in Ukraine changed this commission policy on gas that I have just um, um, outlined it? Well, no, uh, recent events in Ukraine have reminded us that we are too reliant on Russian fossil fuels in Europe, in particular gas, as Europe still imported from Russia around 40% of its gas consumption last year. In the last month, 
gas prices have set historic records and remain very volatile. The war has raised serious security of gas supply concerns in the context of threatens of continuation of gas flows from Russia, calls on imposition of sanctions on Russian fossil fuels, and decisions of individual European gas companies to stop buying energy products from Russia. Renewable and low carbon gases, including biomethane and hydrogen, can help us not only to decarbonize our gas system, but also to um, stop importing um, um, fossil, fossil gas from Russia. They create new markets and job opportunities in Europe. And moreover, with the current natural gas prices, we see that biogas is already cheaper than natural gas and renewable hydrogen can compete with gray hydrogen if it secures power purchase agreements that produces electricity at 50 euros the megawatt, the megawatt hour. When the PPAs will go down to 20 or 30 euros the megawatt, the megawatt hour, then green hydrogen could compete directly with fossil fuels. The future of gas sector in Europe is a decarbonized one. So this is something clear for the commission. The war is just a wake up call for the EU to accelerate the Green Deal and phase out Russian energy dependence. It has brought up a new sense of urgency, if you want. On the 8th of March, the Commission adopted the proposal in response to the current context of unpredictable and high energy prices and the gas security of supply concerns. One of the main pillars is Repower EU, which is our plan to bring dependence on Russian fossil fuels to an end well before 2030. Indeed, the President of the Commission already mentioned 2027. We believe that phasing out the 155 BCM of gas that roughly we have imported last year from Russia is an achievable goal, in particular by acting in three different fronts. The first one would be to diversify our gas supplies, including through LNG. The second is invest more and speed up the deployment of renewables, also as regards as, regard, as renewable gas and hydrogen. And thirdly, we think that we should increase energy efficiency and reduce our energy consumption, particularly um, in light of the next winter. Gas diversification of routes and suppliers is not a new objective for the EU. We have made big steps in the last years and uh, have built, as you know, many new LNG terminals and pipelines from alternative gas supplier countries. The EU Connecting Europe facility has also been instrumental in supporting financially gas infrastructure projects of common interest. But phasing out Russian gas means that we will need to change quite radically our gas network, which is designed to bring gas from the east to the west. And in less than 10 years, our gas infrastructure should look, I think, quite different from the one that we have now. It will need to integrate more domestic renewable gas production, like biomethane, and provide for new import entry points, and probably also new gas infrastructure to transport first natural gas, and over time, more and more renewable gases and hydrogen. So with regards to the development of renewables and green hydrogen, the Repower EU communication announces a number of EU initiatives to facilitate and accelerate deployment, including looking into regulatory changes regarding permitting of renewable projects. We want that um, we produce um, at least 35 billion cubic meters of biomethane every year by 2030. The full doubling the objective that we already put in the Fit for 55 package. To do that, member states, common agricultural policy strategic plans to channel funding to biomethane produced from sustainable biomass sources, in particular from agricultural waste and residues. The Commission has also proposed a hydrogen accelerator initiative to more than double the EU hydrogen targets both in terms of domestic production and imports from outside Europe. 15 additional million tons of renewable hydrogen to be added to the 10 million tons already foreseen under the EU hydrogen strategy should help us replace between 25 and 50 gas PCMs from Russia. 
To get there, the RePower Communication announces the intention to build green hydrogen partnerships with third countries, as well as supporting renewable hydrogen scale up through a new global European hydrogen facility. Finally, an important part of the savings of Russian gas should come through energy efficiency measures. The communication foresees a front loading of the um, deployment of the 30 million heat pumps in Europe until 2030 that we had already announced in the Fit for 55 package, together with other, other energy efficiency measures. In addition, the Commission will present next May an EU saving plan to deliver some of the additional 25 gas BCMs that we, we want to save through energy efficiency measures. So we will come back with more details on these three areas that I mentioned in May, because the Commission has to propose, according, following the, the mandate that the March European Council has given to it, a more concrete repower EU plan. So now to finish, I would like just to mention um, a couple of things about um, how the Commission is going to be uh, focused in the immediate future to ensure security of supply for European citizens and companies. In the current war context, um, gas flows disruptions from Russia constitute a real risk. On the 23rd of March, as it was uh, just mentioned, the Commission came up with a number of proposals uh, to address the immediate emergencies, both in terms of the very high prices that we have seen in electricity and gas, and in terms of security of supply. On security of supply, we presented a plan to establish a platform to facilitate the common gas purchases and coordinate the international outreach to gas supplier countries. We think that by aggregating the gas demand of member states, we could maybe um, better secure gas volumes and at better conditions. We also expect to organize gas deliveries in Europe in a more efficient way, using in an optimal way the existing gasification um, and regasification um, capacity we currently have in Europe taking also account of the um, existing bottlenecks. The platform uh, will focus in a first moment of security, on securing new gas and LNG contracts, but in future, the idea is that it will also facilitate the imports of renewable hydrogen to Europe. Another issue um, uh, that the platform might follow is the refilling of our gas storage capacities. Also, as part of this 23rd of March um, initiatives, we adopted a proposal on storage under which member states will be obliged to ensure that the gas storage capacities are filled at least at 80% by next winter, and this should rise to 90% by 1st November each year thereafter. The proposal also includes burden sharing mechanism to ensure that there is a fair allocation of the cost of filling the reserves. And we propose also a 100% discount on capacity-based transmission tariffs at entry and exit points of storage facilities to encourage precisely the storage of that gas. In addition, storage system operators will have to be certified, certified to ensure that the ownership in a structure does not raise security of supply concerns as the one that we have seen this winter. And there will be a system of prior authorization before um, storage capacity can exit the market. The Commission is aiming at getting this proposal on storage adopted by the European Parliament and the Council very soon, because the next months will be crucial to improve our preparedness for the next heating season. So diversification, storage, energy savings, renewals will be at the core of Commission work in the area of energy in the next months we will be striving to ensure energy security of supply at affordable prices for citizens and companies all throughout this crisis. But this time, the good news is that our short-term objectives very much align with our long-term decarbonization strategy. I thank you very much for listening and I'm a little bit um, sorry that I might take a couple of minutes more than expected. Not at all, Tatiana, and thank you so much.
a, a incredibly comprehensive overview of everything that's on the table for the uh, for the gas sector and of course broadly for, for the European Union and uh, the European citizens. Um, I know you can stay with us a little bit longer, so uh, we've, had, we've had six questions already actually coming in from the audience, so I, I'm just going to try and um, maybe just synthesize a couple of them. Uh, Ian Kilgallen is asking, uh, what will the European Commission do uh, for uh, ensuring uh, the biomethane production and what can you do? Because you set the target, say, of 35 BCM, and I would broaden it and also include the, the green hydrogen, a 20 million tonne target. Um, the feeling is that, of course, the Renewable Energy Directive is out there, the Gas Directive is out there. How are you going to see those given life, I suppose, is the way that I'm going to paraphr paraphrase Ian's question. Yeah, that's very good. <clears throat> Sorry, it's a very good question. And this is one of the topics that we are looking into how to make this operational and achievable objective uh, precisely in that um, may repower EU plan that I, I mentioned uh, in, my, in my intervention. Um, I mentioned also that there are some things already going on. For instance, um, this uh, agricultural policy, um, common agricultural policy funds that should be um, preferably um, a focus now channel to uh, projects of bio, biomass and biomethane, um, in particular to produce uh, biomethane from, um, from, from residues, uh, from agriculture, but also municipal waste. So this is on, already ongoing. There are a certain number of projects that are also um, um, likely to be financed through the uh, recovery and resilience fund that the member states um, are now in the process of implementing. And then um, I think that also from the regulatory um, side, we already did a big step in the uh, in the December package by um, making sure that uh, you know these new gases also have access to the infrastructure. They have um, they pay lower tariffs for the transmission, um, injection, um, uh, and other um, capacity-based tariffs of the of the infrastructure. And also, um, uh, we have, I think, uh, made another very important step uh, last year, at the end of last year, when the Commission adopted the new um, environmental stage guidelines that, again, um, are, are very favorable to, um, uh, to uh, public support from member states um, to um, finance um, with operating aid or investment aid um biomass projects but the most important thing uh, all of it is that if there's something positive about this very high um uh, gas natural gas prices that we have at the moment is that biomethane is now very competitive so at least um i think that many of the um of the things that we have been fighting for um i mean at least in terms of a business case they are they, they start to be there, we start to tick the boxes. And now what we need to make sure is that this is sustainable in time, uh, that does not depend only on the prices of natural gas, but also that the, uh, this, this, this new production of biomethane enters into the, um, uh, the real, the gas infrastructure, it scales up, and we produce the volumes that we think are still possible to be produced. We know that they will remain being, um, it's a gas that will remain uh, relatively at low scale as compared to, um, for instance, uh, future hydrogen production. But still, we need to maximize the potential we have in Europe. No, thanks. Thanks. That, thank you, Anna. Uh, the questions are coming in thick and fast now. We're up to 16. But I know you've got to leave at 10. So I'm going to be very, uh, again, maybe synthetic. Um, one question that has come in is from Pasco Subido. Um, and basically, he is asking a question about how the Repower EU is going to lower price lower prices of gas i think it's the uh, in, in inference when from cheap pipeline gas moving towards lng how is the european commission seeing um, the mechanism if you will uh, how will that impact pricing and okay. help consumers i presume is the end of that question yeah yeah obviously um in uh, facing facing out um uh, russian gas um is 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 not is not a measure to um, achieve affordability of uh, of gas prices. That uh, it's something undeniable. Huh? Um, we know that um, just because of transport issues, transport cost, uh, LNG is uh, is more expensive than pipeline gas, and um, and and we have been um, and we still are um, profiting of uh, relatively cheap um, Russian natural gas, which. Uh, because of our new um, 
geopolitical and strategic objective to um, not to be dependent from Russia on fossil fuels anymore will obviously have an impact on prices. This is why we have come up with this idea of creating a platform for the supply of first um, LNG and pipeline gas, but in the future also hydrogen, to make sure that if we have now to rely on other um, uh, probably more expensive solutions, we will do it at the best possible terms. Um, and the way that we have uh, of doing that is aggregating demand and coordinating better um, the different actions of uh, member states in Europe uh, regarding um, reaching out um, third countries producing gas. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sam. So that's the sort of chart procurement. I've got, because we've got four minutes, going to have two questions. They come from journalists, so Christian from ENDS and Anna from Context. I'm going to say them together because they're both asking uh, more or less the same sort of question. When will the EU energy savings plan that you mentioned be coming out? And when will the proposal uh, on voluntary joint um, purchasing be coming out? Is there a, a timeline, Tatiana, yet in your minds? Do you have a date uh, at all envisioned or is it still under discussion? The joint, pro the joint purchase. The joint purchase is part of the already the proposal that we made in December. So this is already um, on the table. Uh, the, commission, the Commission put it forward and now it's in the hands of the European pa uh, Parliament and the Council. Um, but um, I think that we, we basically um, talk about two different things. Uh, one is the uh, joint port chase mechanism in a, in, a, in a situation of normality where the, uh, the gas market is, is, is working and functioning um, under no stress. And this is more or less what we have foreseen in the December package. Um, another is the situation that we have now where we might need to indeed um, uh, fill our storage um, capacities uh, from very low um, levels um, to 80% this year in a very, um, in a very uh, speedy way when the prices are very high. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to do that, basically, <clears throat> the way that we have um, that we have come up with is basically, as I said, to coordinate in these exceptional circumstances um, the um, uh, the different contracts of gas, um, which does not mean that the Commission will buy um, itself the uh, the gas, but that would negotiate and coordinate um, all these uh, exchanges with producers. Um, and then in the end, it will be for the uh, member states' companies to sign those contracts. No, that's great. Thanks for that, Tatiana. I think it's been really uh, comprehensive, as I said earlier, uh, and really, you've done much more than you. Uh, we asked you to also answering many questions from the audience, really, uh, 23 questions that have come in so far, all directed at you, actually. Uh, Tatiana, it's been a really great uh, pleasure to have you, as I said, and I think that we have learned a lot more. I think we are looking forward to the, uh, as you say, the actual final repower communication when this comes out later on this year, uh, to see the directions that you will, you will now go in. Uh, but I think we found it very important that you also stress that the direction for the gas sector was already set in December. It must be towards decarbonisation, renewableization, and that the war in Ukraine is a massive accelerator to speed that up. Uh, and indeed, uh, certainly in Eurogas, we are fully uh, welcoming uh, that course of direction. Tatiana, thank you for joining us this morning. It's been a great pleasure, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you, uh, perhaps through the legislation that you produce in the coming months. So, uh, yeah, have a good rest of the day. Uh, we will take the questions, uh, sorry, the comments that you've made and the questions from um, the participants and move on to the panelists uh, and see if they can answer some of the questions we haven't got round to yet. Thank you, Tatiana. Thanks for joining us. Thank um, you. Marcus, Marcus from uh, ITM, it'd be uh, actually very helpful if you would come in now and uh, perhaps uh, comment on some of the things you've heard uh, in relation uh, to the objectives and direction of the Commission and the great need and the great urgency that they've uh, outlined for renewable gas like green hydrogen. Of course, ITM Power being uh, the owner of the largest electrolyzer factory in the world, as far as I still recall, Marcus, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. Very nice to be here. Um, our perspective on Repower EU is, is that it's essentially turbocharged the ambition for achieving net zero that already existed with Fit for 55. So 20.6 uh, megatons of green hydrogen is a lot. Um, achieving it by 2030 equates to approximately doubling the manufacturing capacity of electrolyzers every year from now until then, which is a substantial rate of change. And I think the, the expression rate of change 
uh, applies widely. So let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. Uh, we opened, as James said, the largest uh, factory in the world making electrolyzers last year. Uh, we currently have a, a manufacturing capacity of one gigawatt per annum. Uh, that's been expanded to 2.5 gigawatts per annum at the end of next year, and then to five gigawatts per annum at the end of 2024. Uh, we made those announcements uh, back in COP26 last November. Um, and as you can see, that's a factor of five relative to where we are at, at present. Um, given the enhanced targets, it looks probable that the manufacturing sector will be expanding its production of electrolyzers across the period to 2030, um, which is very good news because what that equates to is real term reduction in cost of producing the technology in greater volume, which naturally comes as a result of automation and scale up of the technology. So from our side, this is, this is a very positive development. It's a great opportunity. It's something that uh, we are well positioned to respond to. But I think where I would draw some attention is, um, to put it simply, uh, manufacturing sector can produce a lot of electrolyzer technology um, and go through a significant rate of change. But can we deploy that technology? And right now, from our perspective, it looks like uh, there are applications associated with large industrial processes which use hydrogen and therefore are familiar with hydrogen. There are applications to do with mobility, especially heavy duty vehicles of all types, uh, which are still in, in their very early days, but some very compelling propositions for refueling vehicles. Um, but then we have everything else. Uh, and everything else is what the gas grid connects us to, if you wish. And where we're not quite clear is what the rate of change will be in the gas grid to achieve uh, the 2030 ambitions. Um, so things like what blend percentages will be achieved by what year? Are we going to put blends in the distribution networks as well as the transmission networks? Uh, how are we going to start developing 100% hydrogen grids? What's that pathway look like? Um, there seems to be quite a lot of uncertainty still in terms of the actions required to make that happen in practice. Uh, and we contrast that with, for example, the electricity sector, which seems to be quite clear in where it's heading, which is essentially more solar, more wind, more renewables. So we'd like to see in many respects, what we see is the elephant in the room, the gas grid. We'd like to see greater clarity, understand the rate of change in terms of deployment and build confidence that, that um, our electrolyzers can actually be deployed in those situations and, and deliver that, that decarbonization effect and improve that, that, that energy security aspect. So thanks, James. I think that's, that's my uh, contribution this morning. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Marcus. Uh, indeed, very direct and straight to the point. I suppose we are all interested in what that rate of change will be. And uh, I got the feeling that you're kind of angling towards saying that there's not there's not a formal pathway. I mean, the European Commission might argue back and say that they've got a 5% uh, cross-border blend uh, proposal in the gas, the gas package. So you could say that 2030, we would expect at least 5%. Then I would actually wrap that up and say, is that enough? How do you see that, Marcus? Is 5% ambitious enough? Should it be more? Uh, should there be more flexibility? I, I think it boils down to what is practicable and what can be achieved on the ground. So you can manufacture a technology, but then you need to deploy the technology and operate it. And to operate it, you need some sort of uh, policy structure that remunerates the operator to give them a business case for operating that, that function. Um, and, and for electrolysis, that's all to do with, obviously, the cost of the electrolyzer, but the cost of the input electricity the price of the hydrogen that's sold into, into the grid. Um, and if, if, if there are differences between what the transmission system can handle and what the distribution system can handle, then are they two different percentages? And what can you achieve across the next eight years? Um, what, what are the practicalities of doing that? I think, I think we need to see more clarity in that area. 
Um, I then think we need to understand the transition from presumably blends to 100% hydrogen. And how are we going to do that? And what, what does that look like? Is it, is it about filling large underground stores with lots of green hydrogen? That's great. Just lay the plan. That can be done. Is it about um, mini grids in towns or, or industrial clusters and then growing those mini grids into bigger grids uh, in a sort of bottom up approach? Uh, is it about laying parallel pipes and creating a hydrogen grid alongside a, a methane grid? We, we think there's quite a lot of definition there in terms of a pathway, not only to 2030, but importantly from 2030 to 2050 that needs to be laid out. And we think this is a very large potential market for electrolyzers. So, you know, would wish to constructively contribute to that, to that thought process. Yeah, I think that you've laid out a very, I think, compelling argument in the case that you mentioned the word uncertainty and the uncertainty that you feel about how this will all be done and the clarity you would like also beyond the current legislative framework from 30 to 50, uh, because, of course, that is, of course, very important when we're looking at investments. Uh, Marcus, thanks for that in your opening statement. Uh, I would like to bring in uh, Julia Laura Kansian now uh, to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the biomethane target that we've seen and has been referred to uh, and quite extensively covered by Tatiana in her opening uh, speech, Julia. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Jane, so, for the invitation today um, <clears throat> and good morning all. So yes, I was really happy to hear uh, Tatiana's intervention before. Um, it's clear that Europe needs to disentangle for Russian gas, protect uh, the citizens and businesses from uh, the energy sh shocks, but also step up the ambition to the climate targets. And we were reminded of this uh, at the beginning of this, uh, this week uh, with the release of the recent IPCC report. Uh, albeit the emissions um, by the end of the decade is much needed and possible. So in this context, our sector uh, is ready uh, to deploy the 35 billion cubic uh, meters of sustainable biomethane by 2030, including 3.5 by the end of uh, the current year. This means basically that uh, biomethane needs to increase 12 times compared to today's production. Uh, in relative terms, this represents uh, a much greater effort uh, to what is required to other energy sources uh, within the context of the Repower EU. Uh, nevertheless, we think that this target is realistic, uh, is within sustainable growth increase, and it is timely. Uh, so at this moment, um, it's, it's really timely because decision makers are now discussing uh, the Fit for 55 package. And this offer a tremendous opportunity to readjust the growth trajectory for our sector and also to factor in the increased uh, need for energy security that we have at this moment. So um, this crisis needs really to be the catalyst for faster change to a sustainable energy system. Um, so happy to hear about uh, the idea of having a completely different uh, gas network in, in 10 years time, offering more possibilities to, um, to integrate uh, biomethane. Uh, but in no ways it should lock us in new fossil dependencies. So um, members of the European Parliament have already realized this, and I was really happy uh, to see a proposal that was recently tabled uh, in the ITRE committee um, to embed the 35 billion cubic meter target of, for biomethane in the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, needless to say that we fully support uh, this, this idea of having the target embedded um, in such an important piece of law. Um, but even uh, with a binding target uh, to get from three, uh, the current three BCM to uh, 35 BCM of biomethane in eight years, uh, we need a very solid plan that fits, um, it, that fits in a set of market, but also regulatory conditions. Um, we looked at this with our members and with the value chain that we represent uh, at the European Biogas Association. And um, we looked at four dimensions uh, to make this happen. Uh, basically, these are sustainable feedstock mobilization, planning, financing, and market. Um, so for the sustainable feedstock mobilization, um, there was a reference before uh, in Tatiana's presentation uh, on the central role of the CAP strategic plans. And this is very good because we really think that interconnection with agricultural sector and rural economy will remain important. But uh, we also think that now it's the time to step up the role of sustainable feedstocks such as industrial waste and wastewaters. Um, the second dimension is planning. 
So it's good to have a 2030 target, but we need midterm milestones uh, to achieve the 2030 objective at national level with uh, indicative trajectories so that we can go um, back and check and, um, and act with the gap filling mechanism if this is needed. Um, market is also a very important dimension. And we touched upon on the gas directive and, uh, and gas regulation uh, revision before. So in this respect, we need adequate market conditions, including the establishment of rules uh, that can enable a quick, but also affordable uh, grid connection for biomethane project. Um, and also the authorization and permitting is key. Uh, and I was happy that this was also uh, brought up. Um, because this should be really treated as the highest priority um, and it should be obviously very swift, as well as it should be swift the notification of support uh, within the European Commission. And finally, not for, uh, for importance, financing is of course a very important dimension. Uh, we have calculated that we will need to mobilize around 83 billion euro in biomethane capacity by 2030. So in this context, sustainable investments will be absolutely key. And uh, biomethane's contribution towards circular economy, but also climate change mitigation should be considered fairly uh, in the context of the taxonomy, uh, which is uh, now open and uh, under discussion. Uh, thank you, James. Thanks very much to you, uh, Julia. Indeed, I think I outlined very, very good points, starting with at the very beginning, uh, we pointed out that the 35 BCM is something that's achievable and using sustainable stocks. And indeed, the focus that you mentioned then onto industrial and wastewater as new segments as well, which I think are often overlooked when people are assessing the amount of uh, biomethane that could be uh, created, would fully agree uh, with you on those points. Some questions, though, that come through this, Ava Hennig has said that, you know, Germany has tried very hard um, to bring BIB biomethane to customers and hasn't been that successful. And she says that, you know, a quota is very important. Uh, so if we can say the target. And I think the question that I, that I have is, do you think that the target is now proposed by uh, a group in the um, in the European Parliament? Do you think that this will survive? Do you think it will survive the negotiations with the European Council? We understand the Commission are somehow behind it, that they are supportive, but they've never proposed it formally in legislation. Uh, the European Parliament will now amend it. What's your What's your assessment, your political assessment of whether or not this will this will actually fly and survive in the legislation? Well, we certainly hope so, James, so to be, to be frank <laughs> with you. <laughs> um, well, first of all, we see that uh, the signatories of this amendment are um, influential MEPs that, uh, uh, that are also in joining, um, joining um, the, the discussion as uh, rapporteur and shadow rapporteurs, so they are bringing a credible and solid proposal. Um, we also need to keep in mind that the context of the discussion of the Renewable Energy Directive is also changed because uh, we all have realized the importance of renewables, not only for the, the climate target, but the stepped up of contribution that these sectors need to uh, have uh, to, to the EU energy mix uh, in the light of, of the need for further energy security. Um, so in this context, um, looking at, uh, at the various amendments and the various changes that have been proposed, certainly the ones that is including the 35 BCM uh, should be regarded as uh, a very timely one and as, and as a very important one to structure and to better structure the energy system of the next decade. Um, I just wondered as well, I, I agree with you, I just wondered, well, have you heard any feedback from the member states? That's in the way, the direction I wanted to go with the question. We see them, there is this place in the parliament, there is clearly some support in the commission. It's the member states who are often famous for saying no to targets. Do you see, are you, are you aware of support within the member states uh, that could help this become a political reality? But member states, uh, especially some of them, are really pushing on the accelerator to uh, step up the capacity uh, for, for biomethane production. To do this, uh, um, certain member states are, for example, trying to use, uh, in, in the most efficient possible way, uh, the, um, the, the resilience facility. Um, and I made a little reference uh, in, in my speech to, to authorization and permitting, but also to the, notific to the notification time that uh, 
uh, it takes. Um, and we know that uh, certain support schemes that would really make the difference in terms of step capacity are at the moment under scrutiny um, and have been so for, for many months, uh, which is a bit counterintuitive com uh, compared to the actual need to step up uh, the contribution of the sector. So um, this, is, this is something that we need to, to start with. Thanks very much, Julia. Thanks very much. Really great uh, intervention. Uh, I'd like to bring Roxana in, uh, and certainly uh, last, but by no means least. Uh, Roxana, within the package in the diversification element in particular, uh, there's quite a lot of focus on things that GIE are very fond of. There's a great focus on LNG, diversification from Russian gas towards LNG, but also a lot on storage. And there's even a regulation on the table. GIE being fully involved in LNG and storage. Uh, how are you seeing things, Roxana? Thank you very much indeed, James, for this invitation uh, and uh, going to your question and to be very punctual on what Tatiana has just mentioned in her opening speech with regards to LNG terminals and underground gas storage um, as part of Repower EU and the security of supply plan. So to begin, I would like to highlight two main points about LNG terminals. First of all, LNG terminals, including FSRUs, surely enhance security of supply through source and route diversification, and they secure access to global and competitive energy sources. And we've seen Germany, Italy, France, Poland, Greece, the Netherlands. In the past month, they are betting their best cards on these infrastructures. But let's not forget that we are working in very fast paced times and stormy in the same time. So, so we got to be careful to do things right. And here I would like to mention three things to be done right. Uh, number one, long-term contracts. As we speak, the challenge is to find the LNG. The EU, wants to substitute 150 BCM of Russian gas. This means taking out one third of the global LNG trade. That is not going to happen because the largest part of the global LNG trade is bound in long-term and destination specific contracts. And let me give you two examples here. Qatar, it has an equal distance between Europe and Asia, so they can choose where they go. But they have sold 80% of their gas in long-term contracts to Asia. And it is important to have an open-minded commission in these cases and allow member states for such mechanisms too. There is no way around it. A second example is the US. The US is not always bond in long-term contracts, but their problem is the liquefaction capacity. It is maxed out. So to get more US LNG, they need to liquefy more. And those are typically privately financed projects. So they need to be bankable. And in order to be bankable, they need to secure long-term contracts. Number two, when it comes to very important things to be done right, we need to ensure a fast track approval pr uh, process for the upcoming projects, because it is true we have a bottleneck in the supply, but we are also missing some infrastructure in Europe. So member states have to act very, very, very quickly and be willing to go beyond business as usual. Number three is to ensure the proper interconnectivity into the EU because in order to get the maximum import through the LNG terminals, it is important that the EU can be efficient, that, that the gas can be efficiently distributed throughout the entire EU to the main consumption areas or places with regional or local storage. So we need governments to increase interconnectivity at the borders and to seal incremental capacity agreements. So that is on security of supply. And on the second big point on LNG is that they are needed. Terminals are needed in the energy transition and they are ready to decarbonize. We now have a better view than three years ago 
uh, on what the conversion can be for LNG terminals from their current role to future decarbonization pathways. So what we know today is that LNG terminals can import synthetic and biomethane. This is straightforward and it can be done today. Synthetic methane is also a hydrogen carriers and uh, a carrier and business cases are becoming better and better. So we see uh, countries like Middle East, Oman, Egypt, Morocco, Australia, and Chile, they are uh, ready to produce very important volumes of green methane and the circular economy for CO2 is uh, improving day by day. We now have a much better view also on the technical compatibility between the current LNG installation and ammonia. We can use all the fixed parts of an LNG terminal to receive ammonia of up to 70%. We only need to change compressors and pumps and to build a terminal actually next to the LNG plant in order to crack that ammonia and take the hydrogen out. When it comes to uh, liquid hydrogen, that can be difficult still, but it is also uh, something uh, that we are looking into a very, uh, into a more remote scenario because liquid hydrogen is rocket science. And it really is because the only application of liquid hydrogen today as, at scale is uh, as a rocket fuel. So forget about lock-in effects when we are uh, looking uh, now for additional regas volumes. I would like now to turn to underground gas storage and we agree with the commission on many proposals. For now, I would like to highlight three main points on mandatory filling targets of 80% for 2022 and 90% for the following years. Member states are ready to take all necessary measures to achieve minimum filling targets. But there are still some question marks and missing links. So first, let's look into the national specificities. There is no one size solution fits all. Let's consider what is the domestic gas demand versus what are the technical storage capacities? What are the alternative supply routes? What are the performances and volumes of storage? Look at Slovenia and Finland. They don't benefit from any underground gas storage site on their territory. So they might need to rely on the storage market of their neighbors. So what do you do? You need to share the financial burden within the member states at the regional level. So I would really like a more uh, open-minded uh, approach because flexibility is uh, the key word in this context. A second point is that the storage year has already started in terms of booking capacities on 1st of April. So we are asking for no regulatory changes that would give opportunities for storage customers to revise contract clauses that have been previously agreed on. And third, storage operators like market-based bookings. But that needs some financial support because at the moment, the party that fills the storage without any compensation could suffer great financial losses as buying gas next summer, so this upcoming summer, is expected to be significantly higher than the selling price next winter. So therefore, our underground gas storage operators should be incentivized or at least financially compensated. So the Repower EU makes it clear. Europe needs to strengthen its security of supply. And the gas infrastructure can deliver all that because it is in our DNA. Just give us the tools and we will finish the job, not only now, but also in the future. So thank you very much. And I'm ready to answer any questions uh, you may have. Well, that's great, Roxana. Thanks for that. And you've covered a lot as well because there is so much uh, detail. Uh, and I think you've done a great job of uh, covering some very specific and some very technical elements. There are two quick questions for you before I'm just going to bring you all back to, to wrap up. Um, there are a number of questions that have come in. Uh, looking at constraints, I think, in a way, 
they're questioning how many regasification units that could be installed uh, in, the, in the next, say, two, three, five years, in your opinion. And at the same time, question from a number of people has come in is, is questioning the number of ships that are actually available. So going for LNG also implies ships. Do we have enough ships is the question, Roxana. So well, regasification units, can we build enough? But do we have enough ships? On regasification units, I think uh, we are going there because at the moment, the LNG terminals are doing the best they can. We are at the full capacities as we speak. We uh, may want to look into the Spanish case because they have a lot of regasification capacities, but they need to make sure this is sent out uh, throughout Europe in a proper way. And we are looking at Germany. They are having a lot of projects, very good projects. We are looking at Italy. We are looking at Poland, we are looking at Greece. So FSRUs are a very good option for regasification uh, capacities, additional regasification capacities, and in a very quick way. Uh, and let me give you an example, uh, because LNG terminals, it usually takes around three to five years to build one. But when there is the political will, we can see that case of Germany today that is ready to build one LNG terminal in two years. So it's more than half of the initial timing allocated for the build out of an LNG terminal together with the processes and all that. But FSRUs are a very flexible and quick uh, option to bring more LNG to Europe, so more gasification volumes. And that can take as little as 18 to 24 months but today we are seeing an accelerated process and that would take again up to even half of the initial time needed for building and bringing these FSRUs. So it could go up to 12 uh, and 18 months. So when there is a will, there is a way. And uh, when it comes to the ships taking out uh, the LNG from wherever it is produced and bring it to wherever it is needed, First of all, let's think about, do we have enough LNG to bring to Europe? Because this is the main question. And I think I gave a very clear overview on what is uh, the, the, the situation with uh, long-term contracts and destination specific contracts, Qatar to Asia, US, they don't have enough liquef liquefaction capacities. So let's find the LNG and then we can find the ships uh, that will be just uh, peanuts, uh, I'm sure, uh, to, to bring it to where it is. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, no, thanks for that, Roxana. I like, I like the sort of phrase, peanuts, but I'm never, never sure about that point. I'd like to ask Marcus and Julie just to come back because we've got a couple of minutes before we will wrap up. And I'd just like to ask a, a final question. Um, I think that we have heard a lot today from Tatiana, we've heard a lot from, from each of you uh, and very, very useful. Um, the one thing still hangs over me in a way, though, and the question is, we know the direction, we know where the gas sector should be going. The question is, with everything that's on the table from the gas package through to the latest communications and the regulation on security of supply that we've seen, do you feel that there is enough being done to drive demand for renewable and low carbon gases effectively and sufficiently fast to meet the climate uh, change emergencies needs? I'll start with you, Marcus, then I'll go to you, Julia, and then I'll come to you, Roxana, so you will have the final word. Marcus, are we doing enough or not enough? Uh, no, we're not doing enough. We're, we're focused on production more than demand growth. Um, we need to do more on stimulating the demand side for hydrogen in each of the sectors. Um, we need to link up and join up the dots between production, distribution, and, and, and use. And, and I don't think we're quite there yet. And, and it's, it's tough for policymakers because it's a very big area, but it's no good just acting mainly on one part if you don't follow all the way through the whole chain. Um, and I think, I think there's still you know, plenty of scope for doing that, but we, we need that to be done in the next couple of years, yeah. Thanks, that, Marcus, a sober assessment. Uh, Julia, please. Uh, I convene now with with Marcus. Uh, not enough at all. 
um, indeed, we need to link uh, different sides of, of the market. Uh, the permitting is key, but uh, for the biomethane sector, looking at the mobilization of, of sustainable feedstock, keeping in mind that circular economy is something that, uh, of course, includes agriculture, but goes uh, much beyond it, is, uh, is, is, is very important. And also keeping in mind that uh, if we want to, to decarbonize uh, the, the, the gas uh, grid and the gas network in time, uh, we need to uh, push on, on, on greenhouse gas uh, intensity targets. Um, so that, that will be absolutely key. Equally so. Well, thank you very much, Julia. Thanks for that uh, summary. Roxana, uh, the last word, it's yours. I would like to bring a new element into the discussion, and that is to look a little bit beyond what is done in Europe, because it is clear we are going to need to import huge amounts of gases, renewable, low carbon uh, from outside Europe. So we need to establish long-term partnerships. We need to establish an international uh, guarantees of origins uh, system, certificates, in order to make sure that our customers in Europe benefit from the cleanest possible source of gases that they uh, can uh, receive into their houses, homes, uh, cars, and so on. And let's not forget the gas package. This has to be done really, really nice, uh, really, really good. Thanks very much, Roxana. Indeed, I think we would say as well from your guest point of view that we uh, fully agree with the statements that are made. Uh, we believe though that there has been a good start. It needs to now be really driven home. There has been increased urgency in the last month or so, uh, but we do believe uh, that indeed we would like to see that acceleration continued and a better understanding of the roles of different parts distribution system, different parts of the gas system in its entirety to deliver on the promise of the decarbonization that we have to do, which, you know, uh, everybody, uh, listen, you know, it's 2022 today, we're talking about what needs to be done in 25 years, basically, before 2050. So there isn't that much time. And I think we do need to think very carefully and quickly about how we get these packages through and make sure that they are delivering the future that the gas sector needs. Uh, please, uh, thank, please join me in thanking, of course, Marcus, uh, Roxana and Julia for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure to hear your views, uh, informative as ever. And uh, as ever in Eurogas, we're very, very happy to welcome you and welcome you back uh, to get your views on the topics of the day. We also thank Tatiana uh, for her very uh, generous willingness to stay uh, for half an hour and even go beyond and, and answer Q&A, even though we hadn't really signed her up for that. Uh, so thanks to Tatiana. Of course, thanks to you, the viewers. Um, really uh, been great to see so many of you with us today. Uh, there will be another Eurogas uh, Let's Meet uh, in May. A uh, date will be coming out shortly uh, where we will be uh, looking at, indeed, perhaps in more detail, uh, the storage requirements uh, that are being put on the table. Um, and otherwise, I'd like to thank the team for all the great work they've done in making this Let's Meet a reality. Uh, I wish you all uh, a very safe and healthy and secure rest of the day. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you all, hopefully in person, at the uh, Eurogas annual conference, which is on 14th of June in person at the Sofitel on Place Jordan. Wish you all uh, the very best and uh, keep well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.